music is an ideal way actually for us to become more mindful. Uh, we become better listeners not only to the music we love, but to other people, to the world. And it is a great way for us to actually feel more at ease in everything that happens around us. So I think that, you know, these two disciplines of listening to music and uh, developing one's mindfulness are mutually enhancing. So Nicholas, it's so lovely to talk to you. It's and great to be you, here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for your time. And um, so you're a pianist and you're also a composer. Yes. Mm. yes. So tell me, um, uh, yeah, where are you based? I'm based now, well, not in one single place. I divide my time between the States and Europe, depending on where I have tours and projects. So my headquarters for those two are Boston and Berlin at the moment. Oh, wow. Boston and Berlin, it's not bad. I mean, it's it's lovely to be are, in two yeah. places. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and two quite wonderful places. So yeah. I feel very lucky. Yes. Yeah. So what is it about Berlin that, that um, made you decide to have your base there? Well, a lot of things tie me to Berlin. So two important institutions and organizations that I work with are based here in Berlin. One is my European management, uh, Impresariat Semenauer. The other is Idagio, the classical music streaming service uh, with which I'm working on creating a new platform on mind and music. And also I have family based here in Berlin. So it's the perfect place to be for me when I'm yeah. in Europe. And were you born in, in Boston? No, I was born in Tbilisi in Georgia. And oh, soon see. after my parents moved to Hungary, to Budapest, which is where I grew up. And actually I'm a double citizen of Hungary and Georgia. So yes, I've been around Europe quite a bit. Then I divided my studies between Budapest, Vienna and Florence. Yeah. And then I moved to the States to study at Juilliard for my master's. So that's when I really kind of settled in the States. And now I'm a resident of the States. Okay. And, and Boston specifically? Boston, well, I have um, many musical connections there. And uh, my first foray into the States uh, as a professional was spending summers at Tanglewood uh, back in the day around 10 years ago. And now some personal reasons keep me in Boston. So it's a very nice place to be. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, but now, um, so you said you you uh, grew up in Hungary. Yes. And was this way, way in Budapest? Was this where you started playing piano then? Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's where I and began. What was it about the piano that specifically uh, drew you? Well, it's an interesting story. I had always been very musical as a child and uh, was an avid listener of music from very early on. And I expressed an interest in actually playing the instrument or playing an instrument relatively late, I guess, at the age of six, seven. That's when I began playing compared to uh, some colleagues who might begin at the age of two or three. Um, but I'm glad to have had that time to have developed my musical interests in the interim. And I knew right from the start that I wanted to play the piano because I knew that the great composers all, or at least most of them played the piano. It seemed like an obvious choice to me because somehow, even from the very beginning, composition and performance seemed like two sides of the same coin. And as soon as I started learning how to play, immediately I was scribbling things on a piece of paper. I was writing right away. So those things were very much interconnected in my mind. And to me, the piano was the best expression of that relationship between composition and performance. But isn't it incredible that at such a young age, you already had that insight? You know, that well, you, you put the, the mm -hmm. things together, how you want it to be. Well, I was just finding my way and 
uh, was really free to do whatever I wanted. And my mother was very musical as a child, but she didn't train as a professional musician. And neither of my parents were professional musicians. Uh, my father's a constitutional lawyer. My mother's a political scientist. So it's not a, okay. it's not a um, musical household, so to say. So for me, this was very much just finding my way in a very new world. And I'm glad I went the way I did. As soon as I began playing, it became evident very soon that this is something I might want to be doing as a career because of the clarity of my connection to this world and to the instrument. So it was a, it was a smooth start. But now your parents uh, were not musicians, you said, but they, no. did they uh, do anything uh, in particular that you can remember that uh, sort of gave you this love for the music? Well, once we settled, uh, we had a lot of music at home and my parents uh, were um, very glad to encourage my love of listening to music. And I still have these old uh, CD players that we bought back in the 90s and this enormous repertoire of discs that we collected during this time when my passion really started to kindle. And as soon as I started playing, I couldn't have been more fortunate with how much they supported me and did everything they could to make sure that I could realize my dreams. So I was, I was very fortunate in this regard. But that's um, always so uh, great to hear, you know, when it's parents that not necessarily played the instruments themselves that they, but that they instinctively knew how to encourage you. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting because one might often get in such situations one of two options or there are more options but it often happens that either parents might discourage um, their children from going into music because of the risks involved or the dangers or difficulties of making a career in music which is of course very wise and and uh, understandable because of how risky it is to especially as a pianist try to make one's life as a musician given the inherent risk and instability of such a life. But also one might have musician parents and be very naturally introduced into this world and do it without having maybe spent that much time considering for oneself whether it's what one wants to do. So these are very common scenarios. And I feel very fortunate that I had in a sense, the best of both worlds in having parents who let me make that choice and did not in any sense make it an obvious one for me. It was simply one of the many things I could have done and this is what I chose to do. But then once I did choose to do that, they did everything they could to support me. So in that, I'm very lucky. That is really wonderful. And um but now you're composing, you said as a young, at a young age, you already started writing. Um, and exactly what, what was it that you thought, you know, why, why did you want to start writing? Was it because of the composers that you admired? Or was it something in you that you felt you wanted to, to, you know, that you, that you had these music um, ideas in you? It was both. I knew that all the great composers performed and in fact, all the great performers composed until maybe a hundred years ago. And this was a very common thing. Being a musician meant doing both. And this kind of divided specialization of being either a only performer or only composer is a relatively recent thing in music history. So it just felt very natural. And I had ideas, I had things I wanted to write and express very soon. So that was really very natural. Unfortunately, in my teenage years, I was not only going to the pre-college of the Music University, the List Academy in Budapest, but 
I was also attending a regular school. I was going to a British international school. I had all my usual exams and I enjoyed my academics very much. And it was an important thing for me because even though I was sure I would do music, I wasn't sure in what kind of institution for college I would continue it in. I was still considering my options between going to a conservatory or maybe going to a university where I would do a double degree with music and philosophy or literature or something else. So academics were very important to me. And given the quite extreme workload of keeping up a normal and full-time school, as well as my full-time musical studies, meant that I set composition aside for a while because I just thought I need to practice. And <laughs> I didn't have more yeah. than 24 hours in the day. But... It was once I actually moved to Juilliard after my undergraduate years, where there was this atmosphere of collaboration and interdisciplinary exploration between different fields that I was encouraged to return to composing. And somehow the musical style that I write in today had been formed in the interim in those years when I wasn't really writing because of all the music I was playing. As a pianist, I was still learning how to be a composer. I was still studying music as a composer, even if I weren't writing so much as a teenager. So when I began again in my early 20s, somehow my perspectives and approach as a composer were ready to go, so to say, and I haven't slowed down ever since my composition mm. activities have been really as important to me as my pianistic ones. Well, this is very interesting because um, this is actually a, a type of a life lesson, really, that that time where, you know, you didn't have time to compose, that that actually uh, was the forming or the shaping of what was to come from you. And I wonder yeah. how many, in how many uh, cases, you know, in circumstances in people's lives that that is so. Well, the thing is that I think those early years of developing a perspective as a composer were important because after that, every piece of music I might play, I would approach in this way. Oh, yeah. I grew up in Hungary where I was living in the, so to say, legacy of composers such as Bartok and their students. And of course, living composers such as Kurtag, with whom I worked with, and Ligeti, who died shortly before I began playing his music, which is something I regret rather that I hadn't been born a little earlier. I started playing his age. It's very young. I was 13, 14. And that is when he was already very ill and was, was um, already not in a condition to hear any young pianists uh, playing for him. Uh, he was already in hospital um, in those days. So that is the thing. I had this kind of composerly atmosphere around me and I was playing a lot of new music. It was very natural for me as a young pianist to be playing music that was written currently or a, a couple of years ago or in the past decades. So my relationship with music of the time and with living composers was always very strong and always very clear. I'm fortunate that I didn't have the kind of musical upbringing where I played everything between Schumann and Rachmaninoff and nothing before or after. It was really an important part of my perspective to have this connection with music being written today and recognizing and understanding that that is a central and inherent part of being a musician today or in any time, really. But now you moved from um, Hungary to uh, America, and, and that must have been also um, a big change for you in your life, uh, the, the, the culture and the differences there. Do you think that also made an uh, impact on how you compose? Well, the thing is that I was always quite uh, international in the sense that I went to a British school when I lived in Hungary and 
uh, I had been visiting the States a lot. I actually lived in the States for one year as a child with this, at a very young age, and I don't really remember it. But my connection to the States and to the rest of the world, and especially English-speaking world, was always very strong. So it actually felt very natural to be in New York. It was always my dream city growing up as a child. So I felt very much at home as soon as I got there. And I'd say that my musical style was more European. I had imported this kind of post uh musical idiom uh, in my writing, but then I was very much influenced by American trends such as minimalism and post-minimalism and generally a much more liberal approach in the States to using all the tools available at our disposal, including ones that might have seemed unfashionable or outdated, such as tonality and consonants, triads and all that. Though I must say that the blueprint for the use of such elements in music did not come from the American school for me, but from Ligeti and from his late works and late etudes, where he kind of reappropriated uh, diatonic scales, consonants, triads in a very new and unique way and showed how using them does not mean that one is neo anything, neoclassical or neo-romantic, but can use these tools in an entirely new and modern and sometimes quite revolutionary way. So I felt that the school of thought in the States felt very comfortable for me in in finding my musical voice in that sense in a way that perhaps compositional schools in in germany for example might not be given the current aesthetic trends that are predominant here mm -hmm. now what i sometimes wonder about is that um, musicians in this world that you live and and that you study of course you know so much about music and and all the detail about it now if you compose and you compose something new and something that's uh, maybe not uh, uh, so familiar to to people who are not necessarily in that world how do you think uh is it, is it difficult as as a musician for example to um to introduce that and, and to make people understand what you were writing or what was the intention behind the, the music that you wrote? Well, we have a couple of tools at our disposal. I think program notes are always helpful and more and more, it's a part of our job, so to say, to speak to the audience. It depends in what context, of course, but while I might not speak in the middle of a evening recital at Carnegie Hall, there are many events and many recitals at smaller events and even lecture recitals or discussions or pre-concert talks where things like this feel not only appropriate, but very natural. And it creates a kind of bond with the audience and the listener that one is not just there to perform, but to engage directly facing the audience in a very different way. And I think that's a good thing. I enjoy speaking to audiences. I taught music appreciation and music history for four years at Queens College in New York. And I've had some experience through this in introducing what might be new for audiences that are not familiar with it, whether it's to audiences not familiar with classical music at all and introducing them to Schumann and Beethoven and uh, Rachmaninoff or even Ligeti or to listeners more familiar with classical music and veteran concert goers and music lovers who might not be familiar with the music of Stockhausen or a recently written piece or something by myself. And when I do play my music, I uh, might often talk about it in my recitals to discuss the conception behind them. And I think that it's definitely an important step in familiarizing audiences with this music. One can also say that one should hope that the music speaks for itself and does not need explanation, so to say. And I think that's certainly true. And I've had countless performances, of course, most of the performances of my own music where I have not spoken yet have been well received. Uh, by the public in terms of how they felt about the music, uh, which is encouraging, of course. But whenever I have 
had performances where there's an element of some discussion or introduction or some program notes, I do find that it very much helps. And uh, I've been experimenting with actually a new kind of event, uh, which alternates performances with these short um, meditations or little mindfulness exercises that are a cross between meditation and music appreciation, kind of getting audiences into the into the zone, into the headspace to hear a particular piece of music with some mindfulness cues and then some cues about what to think about and how to listen to the piece of music they're about to hear. And these have been very successful in familiarizing audiences with music that might be new to them and familiarizing them with ways to listen and appropriate and experience this music. But this I find uh, fascinating that you can combine the 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 two, you know, that you um and what where did this idea come uh to you? To, to uh, the, have the mindfulness meditated, the mindfulness and the and the music together. Well, I've been a long time meditator and um, I am now doing a degree in neuropsychology. I finished my doctorate uh, last year, but that was in music. And uh, my dissertation, which has been turned into a book, is actually being published next month by mm-hmm. Springer. Uh, that's on Ligeti, and that's very technical and theoretical and mathematical. But I've been a long time meditator and um, I've studied the field formally as well for a couple of years, part of my doctorate um, was done at Columbia University where I studied Buddhism and neuroscience. And then um, last year I got certified after a couple of hundred hours of training as a meditation teacher. And now I'm of course also doing the degree in neuropsychology, uh, which is based out of King's College in London. And last year I began working together with Idagio on a new project that will be launched soon, which is Adagio Mindfulness, basically um, looking at how to bring mindfulness and what it can offer to both listeners and performers. And there will be lots of resources such as an uh, an interview series and a podcast and some uh, articles and resources, but the core of it is going to be to apps and two series, so to say. One is going to be the Mindful Performer, which is basically, if you imagine a meditation app for musicians like Headspace or Calm for performing artists, which would be meditation training, mental skills, performance psychology, and all this for a performer, uh, training them in how to not only deal with stress, but how to work on music Uh, with a kind of mental approach, imagining uh, one's interpretation, working out physical things in one's mind and using all the sports psychology techniques that have been developed in sport, but aren't really known that much in the music world, uh, which I think is really important. And then the other side of it is for listeners. uh, And this will become part of the Adagio architecture, so to say, where you'll have a kind of... um, music appreciation and listening training course on how to become a better listener through developing one's own awareness and focus and concentration and understanding of how one experiences music through the tools of mindfulness and looking inward and developing one's awareness. And wow. actually the, the, the beta version is already online. Any listeners can check it out at mindfulness.idagio.com. And wow. we're testing the site now and soon we'll have our official launch. And it is out of this idea of mindful listening, of becoming a better listener through developing not only our understanding of the pieces, but our understanding of our own experience of the process through which we assimilate and interpret music and why certain pieces have the effect they do on us and really, you know, observing our own experience in much more detail. This is something that came out of uh, my ideas for Idagio and I've turned this into a live event and I've started doing these and we'll be doing many more of these Mm -hmm. in the coming season. And our responses have been very positive so far to this concept. So I'm really looking forward to presenting this to audiences as a new way of, of, kind of getting closer to the listening experience itself, not only to the music. And, you know, this is so important in this time, I think, also, where we 
understood Absolutely. more about not just our physical health, but also our mental health. And in, in many aspects, um, and many artists, you know, go through and, and, and have gone through these times, you know, with the pandemic and everything also um, through difficult mental uh, times. And uh, isn't that, is this amazing that this actually um, incorporates everybody now, not just the artist, but also the listener. And it's, I find this amazing Absolutely. Wow. I think, I think, I, I think that, you yeah. know, this moment in time has really reminded us of this, as you say. Yeah. And it's really, I think, you know, when I've given these presentations and these mindful recitals and uh, people have listened to the online material, they are all saying this is exactly what we need right now. So I hope it will be a timely offering that many people will derive a lot of use and help from, not only performers, but as you said, listeners as well, because Music has a healing, cathartic and therapeutic quality. And I think that it is worth this closer understanding of why that happens. And mindfulness is, of course, useful for stress relief and many things. Uh, but primarily it is for us to better understand ourselves and our own minds. It is the process of turning our attention not on to the outside world, but inward and observing why we think the way we do, why we feel the way we do, what is the connection between things that happen in the world and how we feel about it, and better understanding our own minds through which then, you know, the greater understanding brings less stress and more centeredness and everything else that uh, all the other benefits that we associate with this. But music is an ideal way actually for us to become more mindful. Uh, we become better listeners, not only to the music we love, but to other people, to the world. And it is a great way for us to actually feel more at ease in everything that happens around us. So I think that, you know, these two disciplines of listening to music and uh, developing one's mindfulness are mutually enhancing. So to say one is good for the other and the other is good for the, for, for the one as yeah. well. So yeah, I really look forward to launching this officially and seeing where it goes. Yes. And can you just imagine if this could be implemented in schools to get yes, children also absolutely. young? Abs absolutely. So there have been many initiatives to bring meditation and mindfulness to schools to reduce stress. And there have also been many initiatives to bring music and music appreciation to schools. And I think this will be a very interesting and promising way yeah. to do this and to create a connection between listening to music and kind of recentering oneself. And yeah. I think that that um, is a very powerful way to bring new listeners to classical music. Because this Absolutely. is at the end of the day, what is so important to keep our field alive. Um, and I am not at all one of those people who is ringing the bells of doom about classical music and yeah. saying it's dead or not at all. I think that it's uh, alive and well and healthy. And of course, the world is changing and we should change with it. But I do believe that um, this repertoire is as relevant and important today as it ever was. I do see a lot of potential in bringing lots of new listeners to classical music through this because there are many who are interested in mindfulness and related fields and meditation and yoga and, and all this who will see a lot of benefit and will see a very welcoming way into classical music because the fact of the matter is it is a specialist field whether we like it or not. And most of the classical music listeners will have had some experience themselves as performers or having studied music uh, as children uh, because it simply familiarizes one with this language uh, and that's undeniable. And clearly, and I think I'd make the argument, some might disagree, but I think classical music more so than other genres of music is, um, more friendly and familiar, the more one knows about it, in a yeah. sense. It is easier to work with this repertoire, especially with new music, when one is familiar with, uh, with, the, with the words, with the language, with the syntax of the style, more so than other forms of music, which have an easier kind of landing as, as yeah. a new listener. So 
we need to find ways to make sure that people are comfortable with this language, which might feel very alien, uh, completely understandably. And with a decline in music education in schools, this is a trend that we have to kind of find new ways to tackle mm -hmm. and deal with. And this is my contribution to this yeah, discussion, so this to is say. Amazing. Yeah. And, and I... We at um, IDAGIO feel that there's a lot of potential here to bring in new listeners to classical music through this. And I hope that once we get the, the machine going, so to say, yes. and the platform is fully launched and is open to subscribers at the moment, anyone who is interested can sign up for email notifications about the launch. And once we get going, I really hope that this will be a way for people to become more um, more familiar and better acquainted with this music because the idea behind mindful listening is that you don't need to have any prior experience either as a meditator or in classical music. And it is not a way of getting close to classical music as is often done in lecture recitals where one throws some theory and history fun facts at the audience in the hope that this you know brings them closer to um, listening and to the music itself, but rather an entirely experiential one. We're not looking at any music theory um, and, you know, a very little bit about the historical background where relevant to the experience. It's rather, why do we feel the way we do when we listen to this? And can we sink into a place where we can observe this process better and really tune into you know, much more about the listening experience than we might be used to thinking about, let's say, how our body responds. Why do we see certain images in our minds when we listen to certain music, you know, and what is the connection between them and what is it in our experience or our own kind of imagination and fantasies that bring about this connection between music and our imagination? You know, what is the pure physical experience of listening to sound and what is the process through which we actually have certain emotions and feelings and thoughts evoked through this, you know, mysterious pattern of sounds in, in our environment. So, you know, we're really exploring the listening experience and our emotional response to it while at the same time exploring musical concepts and how this relates to this experience. Well, Nicholas, I must tell you that I my wish is really that, um, and if, if uh, you know, I'm doing this and and uh, my talking about this, uh, that I so wish that we could change the education system and bring music or art, all forms of art, back into the syllabus, and mm. that that is alongside sure. maths and science, mm. and mm. these types of things just make me so excited because you know it's it's all these steps towards that it's it's all these yeah. people's initiatives who will bring that about so that will happen some sometime it will happen and it's these things that you are talking now that i think is so important it's such great work and um very well done for for Thank doing you. this project yes <laughs> this is amazing honestly um i would love to to um you know follow up with you also about sure. this yeah, later yeah. on mm -hmm. and uh, if if there's anything you know that that you can uh, share more about that at a later stage when things are have developed further then i would so I'd be happy to talk to you again about it. Yeah, I, I'd be glad to. Yes, thank yeah. you. Sure. Yeah, that this sounds This is amazing. Great. But thank now um, I want to ask you now that uh, what would your advice be for a young pianist? Because now I, um, you know, there are many pianists who graduated in during the time of the pandemic and they are now in a freelance world and uh, of course, things changed so much where they usually went through the route of, you know, competitions and, sure. and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. auditions and things. So what would your advice be to a young pianist now who uh, starts um, his or her freelance career? It's a difficult question to answer. I mean, my own career... Uh, in earnest was begun by a competition as well. When I won the Honus competition in in Canada in 2018, 
And that really was the beginning for me. And that is still a relatively um, traditional way of doing it, though it's a very untraditional competition uh, in the support that it gives to the winner, which I was very fortunate about, uh, and the support I still get from them, in fact. So the thing is that my approach had been just to go there and be who I was as an artist and not try to adjust either my repertoire or my playing or any other choice to what I think might work well in a competition. It definitely was a kind of competition where that kind of thing works because they have very much this kind of ethos of the complete artist and part of the way they assess competitors is through their repertoire choices and there's even an interview round and all this so they really look at kind of the the full approach um and they are they're very forward thinking in, in the way they look at this so i was quite lucky in that regard however i would have primarily two things I guess I'd say to young artists, one is about how to deal with the pressures and stresses that come with this field. And the other is with how to deal with, you know, the, the career aspect of this in terms of finding one's way. So in terms of optimizing one's well-being, both at the instrument or as a singer and away from it, and I guess this applies to uh, performing artists generally and not just musicians, is to master the mental game and to understand it because even professionals who are runners and are running in a straight line at the Olympics will spend hours upon hours working on the mental game, learning how to get into the zone, learning how to deal with nerves, imagining the process, doing mental work, imagineering, you know, feeling the kind of kinesthetic response when they'd be running, really playing it out in their head and doing many different kinds of exercises to make sure that it's not only their body that is prepared, but their mind. And this is a big part of any sportsman's life. And we are athletes in a sense, as well as musicians, we use our bodies to perform. And we need to complement our physical training with a lot of mental training as well. And this is what I'm trying to present to performers through the Mindful Performer on Idagio. So this is one resource that I hope will contribute to people better understanding this field. But in any case, whether it is dealing with the nerves of going to a competition or an audition, dealing with simply being critiqued or criticized by teachers or colleagues, uh, whether it is dealing with perhaps joys and disappointments of the field and maintaining one's form, no matter what might be happening around you, making sure that one isn't dependent simply on a good day to be in a good state of mind to perform. All of these things can be learned and are not merely up to luck. And this is something that one can train. And this is what I'm studying formally as part of my degree in neuropsychology. And it's something that I want to pass on and give people resources, musicians resources for this that don't really exist yet. Now, the other thing I would say is that, you know, one has to be true to oneself. And as I said, um, I do not have enough experience with competitions. Generally, I did very few of them growing up and then I took a break and then I just did Honans after a break of many years. And I was fortunate enough there to, to win it. So I, I cannot say that I have really much experience with what competitions need, but I do think that one will have difficulty going far by not being true to one's musical intentions and trying to be something one isn't, even if one thinks that that will be more readily accepted or understood by either a competition jury or by the wider world at large. One has to be true to one's intentions. And the good thing about today is that we have less barriers to entry. You have you know, the internet, you have social media, you have myriad channels, you have apps, you have anything to make one's voice heard. And there are performers that can thank these media and YouTube for their careers, for example. It's not easy. And one can be doing it for a long time without much gratification. But if one has something worthwhile to say, and one has and has found the right way to say it and the right platform, which has never been easier than today in a sense, mm -hmm. then one should make a go of it. You know, uh, it was only a couple of decades ago that one was dependent on a record label or 
an agency or certain concert halls or a competition, you know, these institutions to make it and one is to a certain extent today, but much less so than before. So it's worth taking advantage of this and, you know, making one's own voice heard in the world. Wow, this is amazing advice. Uh, really, and <laughs> and maybe not just for musicians, but for people in in the whole, you know, for mm. all walks of life. Yeah, I hope so because I think that these trends in technology are reflected everywhere. Yeah, and yeah. you know, um, maybe more so than music. I mean, you have so many stars on YouTube as cooks or giving yeah. advice as, you know, on investing or anything. And these are not people that have been employed by the New York Times or Forbes. Yeah. They mm. have grown an online and very important following that translates mm. into real world interactions beyond simply the online sphere through these media yeah. and we do of course know of a couple of careers in the music world that have been established through such routes mm -hmm. so again we've never been you know as fortunate as we have in that sense mm -hmm. today it also of course has a drawback in that those of us who might not want to, you know, be posting so frequently on social media yeah. or wish to, you know, keep uh, a more, let's say, I wouldn't say old fashioned, but old school way of, you know, yeah. just uh, being in one's own world and not having to constantly kind of uh, have the steady stream of output to the world that can no longer happen. One, you know, there's almost mm -hmm. a sense that if one isn't on social media or isn't posting or isn't keeping up one's online presence, since then one has somehow disappeared, <laughs> you know, yeah, and yeah. a couple of the pianists in the older generation, a couple of musicians and performing artists in older generations can pull this off. Mm. But in my generation now, if someone is in one's yeah. 20s or 30s or even 40s or 50s, so to say, uh, basically one needs to keep up one's online presence. Yeah. And um, it can be tiring and and sometimes, you know, it's it it might not be one what one wishes was one's priority, no. but that's part of it. And at the end of the day, to connect with one's users or audience, mm -hmm. listeners, readers, whatever one calls it, is a worthwhile thing to do. And I think that one, once one gets into the rhythm of it, then it's it, it's yeah. really something that can bring and, a lot of joy to have these interactions. Yeah. But it's also um, uh, so nice to see what other people are doing, and I think we, sure, yeah. you know, also connect with connect with other people that but that you normally wouldn't have been able to. I mean, Absolutely. here we are talking, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, and it's. It's great. I mean, if I just think of how many people I've connected to in uh, with in America just through social media, that I yeah, would absolutely. otherwise never even have known of their existence. You know, so, mm -hmm. so that's great. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. So you know, it brings us all much closer, and the yeah. world feels much smaller with this. And you know, I can keep up with my friends who live in faraway places on a yeah. daily basis, and I can make new friends and and you know, build new relationships with yeah. new listeners. So, you know, uh, and you can it's a let brave, the world brave know. new world that we no, have to can, embrace. You can, listen, yeah. you can let the world know of Adagio. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I'm very lucky to have um, a partner in this remarkable application, which is the biggest classical music streaming service. And they are very forward thinking and are really looking towards the future of this industry and of classical music. And I think in the classical music world, we are very lucky to have a team such as Idagio because I think that they're doing a lot that will be important for how this industry moves forward in the 20th, yeah. you know, in the 21st century, coming out of the 20th century. And um, it's, it's really um, a great pleasure and joy to work with them. And I'm very excited for what we will be offering very soon. Yeah. So, um, Nicolas, tell me, what is your wish for the future? My own or for the music yeah. world? <laughs> for you. Well, I mean... I'm very much looking forward to everything that is coming now, you know, so uh, I have many exciting uh, tours scheduled and performances and um, my book is coming out 
out now. This uh, platform is being launched, this app. Uh, I have some new uh, works of mine that will be published very soon. So there's a lot to look forward to on a, on a short term scale. And it is my hope on a slightly longer term scale that um, these things that I will be doing, whether as a pianist or composer or as, a, as an educator in the in the kind of music appreciation and mindfulness sphere and in the performance psychology and all this will be something that people will find useful because, you know, at the end of the day, I had to go out of my way to find these resources when I needed them and I had to do a lot of research. And I hope that people will not have to do what I had to do to find this. And this is what I really hope that uh, they will be readily available and will make a difference in, in musicians' lives. Because I think that it's an incredibly stressful and difficult profession to put oneself out there and kind of withstand the storms of, yeah. of the profession and of, of, this, of this field. It's a very difficult one. And anyone who goes to music conservatory or even trains at a high level growing up as a teenager is putting themselves through a lot of strain and a lot of pressure. And we need to be equipped with the mental tools to deal with it. It should be a part of everyone's training, yeah. yet it isn't. Mm -hmm. And this is really what I hope to change because, you know, I speak to so many people um, about this. And the first thing they'll tell me if they are not a musician is, oh, you know, I played the violin when I was growing up and then, you know, it's the most traumatic thing that ever happened to me. Yeah. Or, you know, I played the piano and I never want to see a piano again because I'm still scarred by my teacher, you know, you know, and, and this is very common and that's very yeah. tragic that it's very common. Trying to get close to music and being a part of this world shouldn't be a traumatic experience exactly. and should yeah. not be something that people dread and are still scarred by decades mm -hmm. later. Um, but the fact of the matter is that it is, whether mm -hmm. because of the way people are trained or the pressures that are put on them and the sense of associating one's performance with one's own self, you know, self-worth, uh, there are many dangers out there mm -hmm. and not only should one bring in, you know, these mental skills for optimizing one's performance, you know, for visualizing performances and practicing in one's mind and all these things that are enormously useful, but also to deal with the psychological aspect of all yeah. this. And this is really what I hope these resources will bring to, you know, musicians around the world. Mm -hmm. Because that is also something where um, somebody once mentioned and said that um, if we think there could be people who just mentally couldn't deal with the stress, um, mm -hmm. that could have been great artists, but that they just, uh, you know, things prevented them from continuing. And if we think, how sad is that actually, you know, to think Absolutely, that some yeah. people just by, because they didn't have the mental, they were not mentally equipped to, to deal with it, uh, that we lost actually out on many, on gr artists, yeah, many uh, great many artists. Art yeah, yeah. And I don't think that any of them would have not been able to do it had they just had the tools to do so. Exactly. And I think yeah. that actually many artists that did make it, mm. um, made it at an enormous cost. Yeah. You know? Yeah. At an enormous cost and mm -hmm. still were haunted by those demons throughout their lives. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, there was a time where in music, you know, this idea of, or in art generally, this idea of actually trying to confront one's, you know, uh, fears and whatever they might have been was antithetical to being an artist. Somehow suffering was part of the art. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I think that's, utterly counterproductive, mm -hmm. you know? Yes, one can transform one's suffering into art, sure, mm -hmm. but one will perform that art better if one is not suffering in that exactly. moment. So obviously all our life experiences form part of it, but being in a, you know, strained state of mind mm -hmm. does not help act the actual quality of the performance. Yeah. And one also needs certain tools to be able to transform difficult experiences into the best artistic expression they can be. It's not straightforward either. Mm -hmm. So, you know, 
this is something that we have to try to change. And this is my contribution to this effort. Wonderful. So to say. And, you know, Wonderful. I hope it works out. I, yeah. I really, I think you're doing great work and I really Thank admire you. Thank you so much. Your, yeah, no, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Nicholas, now just something on a, uh, just a last thing. Um, I'm sure, doing a shout, sure, yeah. a shout out for, uh, for businesses or for, for restaurants and coffee shops in the world. Mm. Okay. Which is your favorite coffee shop in the area or restaurant that you want to do a shout out for? Oh, good grief. That is a difficult one. Really? Um, well, there are so many and yeah. uh, I've had many wonderful experiences. I should maybe just think of um, the experiences I had recently. Yeah. I was just in uh, Budapest and London, actually. I came back a couple of days ago because I had a a performance at uh, the Royal Festival Hall on oh, Friday wow. in London with, with the Budapest Festival Orchestra. It yeah. was a Stravinsky celebration and we did the Stravinsky Capriccio with Maestro Ivan Fischer, which is a wonderful. a wonderful and unforgettable experience. But we had our rehearsals in Budapest. Mm -hmm. So we, um, uh, while there, um, I visited a restaurant quite close to my heart, which is uh, run by uh, friends of mine. It's a Georgian restaurant called Khachapuri. Khachapuri yeah. is, of course, a Georgian dish uh, in Budapest. And, and I've seen them develop this concept of how they present a kind of modernized Georgian cuisine from the very beginning and trying out different ideas on how to uh, present the food and the menu and the, the, wow. the layout of the, the layout of the uh, restaurant and all this. And, and it was very nice to see this process and it was a very much creative process. And, you know, I often thought back to, you know, the artistic process in that sense and yeah. listening to the audience and the users and seeing then how does one change it. So it was, it was, it was a great journey to witness um and and yeah so if i were to choose yeah a, a okay. restaurant to shout out to it would be that for many reasons beyond just the food it's yeah it's, okay. it's a very special place for me oh wonderful but will you please send me the name or the uh, uh, uh website a link, link yeah, so sure, I, sure, sure, can, sure 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 yeah. sure sure yes it, absolutely are they on, on yeah. they on instagram as well I believe they're everywhere. Okay. So, so yeah. I will find yeah. them, yeah, and I will definitely yes, link absolutely. them to your interview, yeah. Yes, sure. sure. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you so much, Nicolas. It was really lovely to talk to you. And um, thank you. Uh, lovely to meet you on Zoom and with your wonderful project. Um, I would love to speak to you again soon. I would love that too. Thank you very okay. much, Petra, and speak to you soon. Okay, thank you. Thank Have a lovely you. day. Thank you. Bye. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.